Greetings everyone. It's a slow day at work. I thought I'd record a video while I was here, save my free time for something else, as you can see. Not a lot going on today, not for me anyway. Been a pretty busy last week or so, but uh, another book I wanted to do a review on, this is a book uh, that I've known about for a long time. It is not a particularly libertarian book. It's not meant to be. It is extremely interesting, however, and that is the autobiography of Malcolm X. This is a widely regarded book. It's very influential, and I will say for those of you who are maybe interested, if you don't want to take the time to read the book, it is uh, a passable uh, substitute to watch the movie. Um, and actually it says here, this, this book of course was mass printed, so that means that it tends to be cheap. I'm sure if you go on Amazon you can get this for pennies plus shipping. Um, this is just a paperback and if you look closely you can see that is Denzel Washington on the cover, so this book was likely printed in conjunction with the movie, but the sticker, it's not a sticker, the faux sticker on the front says, the book that the script was based on for Spike Lee's film, Malcolm X, a major motion picture from Warner Brothers. Um, having seen that movie a few times, and although, you know, I've only seen it on television, I never bought it or rented it or anything, uh, I always liked it, and I'm not a, I don't really care for Spike Lee at all, uh, but I always thought that that was a very good, good, good movie, and, uh, I think it's a testament to the material that it's based on more than on the director, although he does a good job. Um, and I do think Denzel Washington was an excellent Malcolm X, but I think the material that they're covering is so interesting, a, essentially Malcolm X's life, that it would be kind of hard to, you know, it, it wouldn't be too difficult anyway to make something that's worth watching, and that's definitely the case. Reading the book, um, there are many, many scenes and episodes that are in the movie that are lifted directly from the book. Uh, sometimes in extraordinary detail. Um, there's a scene, for instance, in the, in the movie where uh, Malcolm X uh, plays Russian roulette with a gang of thieves that he's organizing. And uh, he intimidates them by you know, pointing the gun at his head and pulling the trigger repeatedly and taunting them to try the same, and since they don't, he becomes the de facto alpha male of the group. Um, this biography wasn't actually written by Malcolm X, it was the as told to to Alex Haley, the author most famous for writing Roots. Uh, at the end of the book, Haley writes his own, I would say, 30 to 40 pages of, of commentary on Malcolm X and on writing the book. He said part of his agreement, this is of course Alex Haley's version of events, Malcolm is not around to, to uh, critique this, uh, is that he agreed to do the book uh, and one of his conditions was that he would be able to, that well A, Malcolm would have final say on everything that was in the book, uh, that he would be able to change or edit it any way he liked, uh, but uh, in compensation then Haley would be able to write an unamended section that would be explicitly from Haley and he actually talks about that scene he, has a, he had a conversation with Malcolm X when Malcolm said he actually, when he did the Russian roulette with those burglars, he actually palmed the bullet. So he, he wasn't actually using a loaded gun. He used sleight of hand to make it appear he was to intimidate them, although there was no... And then he actually told Haley not to write that in the book because at the time uh, Malcolm X was worried that he was going to be assassinated and he felt that if he wrote in an autobiography that he had been bluffing, the people would take his his claims that he was his life was in danger as another bluff. Now, as it turned out, it was irrelevant. He was assassinated before the book even came out. Um, so the scene from the movie is accurate from the book, although Haley says that that part of the book is false. Which, now that I mention it, makes me wonder how much of the rest of the book is stuff that uh, Malcolm misled Haley about, or he didn't mislead Haley about and Haley just chose not to disclose in the back uh, and, or subsequently. My sense of it is most of it seems to be true, most of it seems to be corroborated. I have not read many accounts saying that it is uh, a lie. Of course there are th things that are omitted. Uh, there have been people who have written biographies of Malcolm X who have described events that are not in this book that 
for whatever reason uh, he did not include. Uh, so basically the form of the book is a standard biography. It goes from his early childhood, uh, basically growing up in Lansing, Michigan, which is a little ironic for me because I attended school in Lansing, Michigan, or at least uh, adjacent. I lived in Lansing for three years. Um, so I was familiar with the high school and the middle school, the, all the town names. Although obviously the city has changed a great deal from when he was growing up there in the 30s, the early and mid 30s. Uh, that was actually, there are several interesting elements that he, his mother was, his father was murdered, or died anyway, under mysterious circumstances. He alleges that his father was killed by the Klan or actually another white supremacist group. I forget what it was called. Um, others say it was an accident. It's not clear. Uh, his mother was found to be insane and she spent approximately 30 years in an insane asylum in Kalamazoo. Um, the th multiple children, I think they have five or six children, um, they're split up to foster homes and there was some interesting stuff in there about gun control actually. Uh, in Michigan I had always heard that the pistol registration, and there is Michigan you can buy a pistol, the first handguns that I had to buy, I had to first get a permit to purchase them. I had to go to the police station and say I wanted to buy a handgun. Um, there's no discretion, they had to give me the permit provided that I could pass a 10 question true or false test that was uh, very easy. However, once you purchase the gun, you'd have to bring it in to the police station, which I must say is a very awkward experience, especially for an anarchist to walk into a police station with a, a, a firearm. Uh, and uh, have a safety inspection, uh, which is essentially just a registration. In fact, I joked with the officers, you know, if I had passed the safety inspection. Now, it is liberalized since I bought my first guns, and you no longer have to get permission beforehand. You don't have to bring it in. However, when you do purchase a gun, you have to bring in a little piece of paper, so there is a registration. However, I had always heard Gun Owners of America had published some articles that the origin of this law was to prevent blacks from getting handguns. The idea being that when a black would come in with a handgun, um, well, what happened is uh, a black gentleman, a, a doctor apparently named Ossian Sweet, if I'm remembering the story correctly, moved to Detroit, the Klan attacked him, he shot, he shot them, he shot several of them, one of whom died, at least. He was charged with murder, he was acquitted, under, thankfully, uh, as self-defense, but people didn't like the idea that blacks could have guns, especially handguns, interestingly enough. And so this law was passed as a way to weed out uh, Negro uh, handgun ownership. And, uh, you know, if you came in with a handgun and you were white, obviously no problem. If you were black, they would say it fails the safety inspection. Now, I read that from the Gun Owners America. I had no reason not to believe it. I always knew that there were anti-black racist the, the gun laws. That is the, the genesis of gun control, classically speaking, in the United States. I never read any corroborating evidence, and yet uh, the first few chapters of Malcolm X's autobiography is, is replete with that. Uh, the state, before his father died and afterwards, would come by the house frequently to do searches to find handguns. Uh, interestingly, they, were not, they didn't care about long guns, rifles, shotguns, which they also owned. Uh, and I believe that they did have, I think he says that they did have a handgun, but they kept it hidden. Uh, and that it was never found. Another very interesting kind of depiction of the times is when he was placed in foster care, he was allowed to bring with him his firearms, he had at least a 22 rifle that he used to hunt with. Uh, and I, it just shows the times, the idea that the state would allow a child, in this case even a black child, uh, to bring with them uh, a firearm. Gotta go. I apologize for the interruption. Uh, one of my coworkers came in here and I had to talk to him for a little bit. Um, so that was a very interesting early aside. You know, that's in the first maybe 15, 20 pages of the book that he talks about that. Um, and then it's a standard biography of his life that is it's interesting in the sense that it gives you kind of a, a feel for, you know, the 1930s, early 1940s America. Uh, from, you know, I haven't read too many biographies. You, talk, you read about the history, you read about FDR, you read about all these things. And uh, it's very kind of refreshing, even if it's not particularly libertarian, to have a kind of man-on-the-street kind of uh, perspective. Uh, when he was... Uh, well, in, in, 
in middle school, he was uh, g very good academically. He was elected president of his class. Um, he wasn't very driven or anything. It was just something that, that happened. I think it's prescient that it happened. Uh, it shows something of the, of the inherent character of this person, who uh, I think it's fair to say was an outstanding, um, you know, astounding human being when you look at him, despite his many mistakes and flaws. Um, but he was very, not very conscious of, of this happening. Um, but he had a, a, a very important experience that didn't strike him as important at the time, but um, was very formative in him and his views later that is depicted in the movie of talking to one of his teachers, and he names the teacher. I often wonder if this person, uh, this person would long since be dead, but they would have probably have family still. Um, this teacher asked if he had given any thought to what he wanted to be when he grew up. And Malcolm actually had not given any thought to what he wanted to be when he grew up. He really didn't care. He wasn't thinking in those terms. Um, but just as a whim, he kind of said lawyer. Not because he wanted to or because he actually aspired to that, but because he uh, just thought, well, that seems like a nice job, I guess. If, if I'm going to be asked, then that's what I, I will say. And the, the teacher said that that would that was an unrealistic expectation for a nigger and that he should consider perhaps being a carpenter um, since he was good with his hands. Now this did not incense Malcolm at the time, although it would much later. Uh, he left school early, I'd say right after eighth grade, something around there, and moved to a half-sister of his, a much older half-sister from his father's previous marriage, uh, a woman named Ella, uh, to Boston, which was a very big example of culture shock for him. He considered himself from the sticks, although Lansing, even back then, was not really the sticks. Um, but relative to certainly Boston or New York, it was. And this is when he begins his nascent descent into, a, you know, a nefarious world of criminality and, and vice. Um, he immediately begins uh, socializing uh, with other blacks, which he didn't have much occasion to do. There were certainly blacks or black areas in Lansing at the time, but they were much smaller than those in Boston. Um, this is when he starts talking about white women, dating white women, the appeal of white women, the appeal of white women to men, to black men, the appeal of black women to white men, uh, and not too long after he started, he was in Boston about two, three years, he moved started to hang out in, uh, well he got a job on a train and then ended up spending a lot of time in Harlem and then he became basically this uh, you know petty street entrepreneur you could say in a positive spin in in Harlem. Uh, being a pimp, running drugs, selling weed, selling other drugs but mostly weed. Um, some of the other biographies about him allege that he engaged in prostitution himself including gay prostitution. He does not talk about that in the book although that's not necessarily you know, indication that it didn't happen or indication that it did for that matter. Um, and, you know, it, he, he at this point has really no kind of political awareness or social awareness. He's very, very high time preference, we would say. He's only thinking about the next fix. The next, he's always getting drunk, always getting high, um, always sleeping around with white women, never really interested in a relationship of any type. Uh, you know, he describes having met women who he, in retrospect, thinks were looking at him with an eye of, you know, maybe something of a serious relationship, and he couldn't see next past the next blowjob or, or next dance. He talks about how much he liked the dance. Um, and eventually, you know, his career becomes more and more intense to the point where he begins carrying firearms, and next thing you know, he's engaged in burglaries. He forms a little gang of burglaries. and. Uh, you know, I talked about this earlier. Uh, he kind of intimidates the other members. Uh, two of which, one was a, a, a mulatto, the other was a black friend of his who was trying, who spent his life trying to create a jazz band uh, with moderate, though non-stunning success. And then two white women that he had a long relationship with. Uh, they engage, and this is this is in the movie. So if you see the movie, you'll see this. Many of those scenes with that band of thieves the dialogue that's straight from the book which is not it's admitted like Spike Lee makes no uh, you know doesn't pretend that he's he's coming up with the stuff uh, but he executed it well so give him credit I guess um, 
Eventually, uh, this burglary r racket was caught. Uh, he stole a very expensive watch that was that was broken in a very specific way and he made the mistake of bringing it to a jeweler. The owner had gone around to all the jewelers aware that the watch was broken and informed them that he had had this watch stolen, what it was like and the nature of the of the of the um, damage and the uh, watchmaker found you know recognized it informed and uh, Malcolm 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 Little uh, was arrested and ended up being sentenced to prison. Now, in prison is when he found both religion and politics. Now, it's it's almost a bit of a prefigure, but his family, from his father's side, especially, I don't know about his mother's, were Garveyites. Marcus Garvey was a black nationalist in the early 20, 20th century. In fact, if you've seen the show Boardwalk Empire, uh, in the third or fourth season, I don't remember which one, the, the, the last one to be finished, um, the Dr. Marquis, Marquis is a Garveyite. He's a follower of Marcus Garvey. Uh, and Malcolm's family were Garveyites. However, M Malcolm left his family essentially before they were, before he really got inculcated. While he was in prison, he had correspondence with one of his, several of his brothers and his half-sister, Ella, and at one point, one of his brothers came and told him that uh, he was espoused in a new religion, the religion of the black man that basically said God is black. This is one major difference with the movie. In the movie, there is a character in prison named Barnes, who was a composite mostly of Malcolm's brothers, uh, I think Wilfred. Uh, and I don't know why that would be. I don't see why it would be difficult to include Malcolm's family. Malcolm's family is is notably absent from the movie. I don't know why that would be, except perhaps that his family is still around. Uh, but there's lots of other personal people who are in this who are still around. Uh, so I don't know why he was composited together. Maybe just to make it better for them to have scenes together in prison, because obviously he would only be meeting his brother, not in talking to him in prison. Um, and, you know, his, his brother was interested in this religion, and when he, when he told, it, told Malcolm this, that, you know, white men are evil, white men are the devil, uh, Malcolm thought about it, and he decided that every white person he known had been evil, uh, and that this was probably true, and he began reading. He began reading an enormous amount. He talks about the books he read. He read Gregor Mendel, he read Spinoza, he read... Hegel, he read, he had he had 15 hours a day, and the other time was just spent sleeping or it was too dark to read. He developed astigmatism. Uh, he became a voracious bookworm, something that was not ever evident, really, in, in his character before that. Uh, obviously, there weren't books on the nation of Islam there, which is the religion his brother was referring to. Uh, a very bizarre, quirky religion. Uh, that was formed in the 1930s by a mysterious person, a person who disappeared, uh, Farood, oh, what's his name? Uh, we don't know his real name, actually, Fard Mohammed. This person who was somehow biracial, claiming to be God, convinced this other man named Elijah Poole that he, indeed he was God and that Elijah Poole would be his messenger, the messenger of Allah. And then uh, whoever this guy, Fard Mohammed, he disappeared. Some people think he went to New Zealand. It's really one of those things nobody knows. And uh, Elijah Poole became Elijah Muhammad, and he founded uh, a mosque first in Detroit and then one in Chicago. And he had this very small religion that people estimated a few hundred probably from the 20s, 30s, and the 40s, and or not the 20s, the 30s, 40s, and into the 50s. And it's in uh, Malcolm was sentenced to prison in 1946. Uh, it was during the 40s that uh, he was exposed to the religion. He began a correspondence with Elijah Muhammad. Um, he became convinced that this man was a prophet, and that this was a valid religion. Um, and he, but what really, what really stuck to him, both in his subsequent rhetoric and what really appealed to him was the idea uh, of black nationalism and really anti-white uh, racism, the idea that all whites are evil. Uh, to one degree or another. Now, the re religion asserts that they're descended from a, a mad scientist who created uh, devil things out of monkeys or something like that. It's, it's actually quite bizarre. Uh, 
Malcolm apparently did actually believe this, but what really appealed to him was the black nationalism. So by the time he gets released from prison, he'd already uh, become known to the FBI because he'd written letters to President Truman against the Korean War and also declaring that he was a communist, which is interesting. There's a, lo there's a lot of vagueness about his political philosophy from the book. You really don't glean you know, whether this guy, whether you would call this guy a libertarian or, or, or what. I'm not claiming that he is, uh, you know, because his philosophy is so based on collectivism and a collective condemnation of whites that it's very hard to draw other conclusions from that. In any event, he became very active in the Nation of Islam. Uh, oh, and I should say, at one point in prison, he had some kind of vision, something happened, uh, in the movie, it is depicted explicitly as Elijah Muhammad, and I believe Elijah Muhammad even speaks in the movie. In the book, he describes a much more vague experience, that he felt the presence, and the only thing that he would say about the person is that he was non-white. Uh, in the book, he speculates that it was Fard Muhammad, the, or the you know founder of this religion, that, that Malcolm never knew, that never, he never met, he'd, he'd been he disappeared 20 years before at this point, or 10, 15 years before, something like that. Um, it's, it's more vague in the book than it is in the movie. Uh, he becomes active in the Nation of Islam and begins uh, proselytizing it, and its size expands tremendously from a few hundred until by the end of the 1950s, the early 1960s, we were talking about tens of thousands, uh, many, many temples, and uh, Malcolm was totally committed Apparently, he spent all of his time and all of his money. He he didn't care about making money. This is his, I mean, this is his version, but other people would corroborate this. You know, he wasn't making any money. He wasn't doing any graft. He was doing everything he possibly could to spread the nation of Islam. Uh, but the rhetoric that he espoused and that appealed to people was black nationalism. And you read the book, and the collectivism is just so absurd. I mean, when he talks about the authors that he was reading, he talks about how much he liked, how much he was interested in and liked Spinoza. Why did he like Spinoza? Because he decided that Spinoza was black, which Spinoza was not black. He was Jewish and he was Portuguese, and he probably might have had darker skin. Um, and that's probably true. And one thing I never quite understood watching the movie is, okay, why are they conflating, um, you know, Chinese people and Africans all together? And it's like whites are one thing and then everybody who's not white is one other group um, you know because black Africans are not the same thing as Australian Aborigines or you know Vietnamese or Native Americans and the, the truth is that's the way they looked at it that whites were especially evil and that everybody else uh, was brown and that they were you know of a kin or you know uh, to be to be lumped together and so I guess that that was you know, that didn't make sense in the movie to me, but that was part of their, their religious belief. Uh, so, what's very interesting about him is that uh, later in his life, he, even though he devoted more than 12 years to the Nation of Islam, he came to reject basically everything about it. Uh, or nearly everything about it. Um, the proximate reason for him was the hypocrisy of Elijah Muhammad. Uh, one of the tenets, one of the major, major tenets of, of the Nation of Islam is that uh, it, that you, you don't commit adultery, you don't, you don't fornicate, that sort of thing, and uh, Elijah Muhammad was doing this. He was having affairs with his secretaries and having children by them. And uh, in the book, Malcolm says that he started hearing about this in the, like, 1957, 1958. He really was so enthralled with the man that he just chose to ignore it. And this is actually very similar, you know, he was constant, and I, I often wondered about this, because if you look at the nation of Islam and then you look at actual Islam, the two are extraordinarily different, even at a superficial level, other than the name. And I always wondered, how did he go about all these years and never realize that you know what Elijah Muhammad was teaching has little to nothing to do with either Sunni or Shiite or any of the types of Islam that are out there? And I thought, well, you know, maybe maybe Islam was not so common back then, and so it was easy. And that's true. Like the reason that uh, Elijah Muhammad's cult, uh, if you want to call it that religion, if you want prefer that term, 
um, didn't seem so absurd is because people weren't familiar and Islam was this, uh, you know, exotic thing that people had no direct knowledge. Uh, there was no Wikipedia back then and, you know, the chance that some scholar was going to have any influence on a whole bunch of disgruntled churchgoers in Detroit or Chicago is very limited. Uh, but he describes going to cal campuses and people would come up from the Middle East, from Lebanon or, or Syria or Jer Jordan or, or, or Egypt and say, this, what you're talking about is not Islam at all. Uh, you know, it, it's completely, it has nothing to do with it other than the name. And his kind of reaction was, you don't know Elijah Muhammad. I know Elijah Muhammad. He saved my life. He, ro he, ro he, he raised me out of prison. He reformed me into who I am today. You don't know who he is. You don't know what you're talking about. Uh, and that's kind of the way he rationalized it. And similar with the adultery, he just said, look, this is Elijah Muhammad we're talking about. It's very similar to how a libertarian might view, not very similar, but similar enough to make the comparison to say someone who's a, an obsessive Ron Paul um, uh, apologist. You know, look, at the end of the day, he's Ron Paul. He wouldn't, you know, he wouldn't try and... Uh, suppress a website that uh, might, you know, with a domain name, whatever, or, you know, something like that. You know, he would hear, he would hear critiques, but he would dismiss them uh, readily. However, these became more and more difficult. And then what happened is uh, the nation became very jealous of him. Some people, some ministers within the nation, especially, uh, especially Elijah Muhammad. Uh, be, and if you go and watch Malcolm X speak and there's plenty of videos of him online I wish there were more um, it's evident this guy is highly intelligent very articulate very persuasive even though he's arguing from for an absurd position he makes it um, he makes a compelling case especially if you're not one for details but it, you know he clearly is intelligent uh, and it's widely believed and I think it's it's close as demonstrable as possible that he is the, the responsible for the growth of the nation of Islam and this caused great jealousy especially among Elijah Muhammad that he was the true kind of uh, head of the nation and not this old man who did not have great public speaking skills which by the way Malcolm always saw was evidence of his divinity that this guy is so humble and he's so obviously from the sticks and he was he was from Georgia uneducated that you know yeah, the thing, but he's had such an effect on me and on other people that there must be some kind of supernatural force that's taking this less than a normal man and making him have these extraordinary effects on people. Not realizing that, it, not until later anyway, that it was his own extraordinary efforts and abilities that were what made Elijah Muhammad more than a nobody, um, essentially. So, he and the nation had a falling out. Uh, ostensibly because he made comments about uh, uh, JFK getting assassinated um, and the nation silenced him and then while he was silenced they started bad-mouthing him saying he was being disobedient which is not true he went out of his way to say I totally agree with that whatever Elijah Muhammad says I will obey I will be disciplined by him he was absolutely submissive to this man and they took advantage and when he saw between their hypocrisy and their betrayal, uh, he left the nation and kind of set off on his own. This was treason. There are still people in the nation of Islam today who will call what he did, which was essentially nothing. It was to walk away and then speak the truth after it had already been revealed. He did not reveal uh, the adultery or the fornication of Elijah Muhammad or the hypocrisy. The press did. Uh, and actually he had become he talks about that was interesting. He was he was aware. He was still going around saying everything I say is from Elijah Muhammad. Everything I believe is from Elijah Muhammad. And he was aware at some point by the early 60s that Elijah Muhammad was a huge hypocrite. And he was worried every time he spoke, every time he went on television or radio or do a class, that someone was going to say, "But what about here? Look, I have this art news article from what, what the L.A. Times or the Chicago Tribune or whoever pointing out that Elijah Muhammad has all these affairs." And he was terrified that that was going to happen because he didn't know what he was going to say in that event. Um, now, when it looked like it became increasingly obvious that this was eventually going to come out one way or another, he talked to Elijah Muhammad's son about, well, maybe we should start preparing the members of the Nation of Islam for this shock. 
Um, and this is represented in the movie where they start saying, well, and it, it's, it's represented in the movie in a way depicting Malcolm as being dismissive of even attempting to do this, but in the book he says that he actually tried. Let's teach about Noah, let's teach about all, you know, Solomon and David, about all these people from the Bible who um, committed adultery, who committed other sins, and the message is going to be, if you do good things, then sinning is okay, and obviously Elijah Muhammad is, you know, the messenger of Allah. He's allowed to do things like commit adultery. Um, and so Malcolm X actually kind of mentally prepared himself for this. And I don't know if it was, you know, his ethics or his moral indignation or if it was his realization that there was no reason to come to bat for these people since they were about to throw him under the bus and, as it turns out, very likely kill him. Um, you know, I don't know. I have, I have questions. The character that's developed, depicted in the movie and the character that comes across in the book and the character most people talk about as one who's totally upstanding in terms of acting on what he believes his principles are including realizing that his principles are all erroneous and at the end of his life it appears that he was not sure what his philosophy he said that except a couple times towards the end uh, although i'm not saying that is an inaccurate representation of the man i have to wonder based on you know his own testimony in his book okay well he sure went a long way years potentially more than half a decade uh, you know going on with something that he believed was wrong but eventually he broke uh, he started to convert more to Sunni Islam he went to Mecca at this point uh, he began to soften on his racism because he met because he met white Muslims uh, and he kind of came up with this notion that maybe the racial animosity in the United States could be tempered if everyone converted to Islam which is kind of like the evangelical uh, Islamic solution to everything, I suppose. It's just like the Christian who tells you you can get your life together if you just become a Christian. Um, maybe it's true advice, maybe it's sincere advice, but there's also a, a theological element to there that you have to wonder how much of this is advice and how much of this is someone living up to their uh, perceived theological obligations. In any event, uh, I, I guess I should say, you know, why I'm even interested in this. Obviously, I saw the movies, but they didn't. They just like, oh, that's an interesting guy. I don't see it. It's a well-made movie. Um, there is another YouTuber who, sadly, almost never ever makes videos any longer. I don't think he has for three or four years. By the name of Anton Beatty. If any of you have ever watched him or listened to him, uh, let me know. Like he's pretty unknown, I think, at this point. And you wouldn't know it by looking at his videos. Uh, as far as I mean, he's explicitly said this, and maybe his position has changed over the years. Although I, I doubt it. Uh, that he's an anarcho-capitalist, but you wouldn't know it because most of the stuff that he talks about is from a left-wing perspective. Um, he's done interviews with Noam Chomsky and Howard Zinn and a whole host of other left-wing people, and when he does, he doesn't critique them. He's basically just asking them to say their piece. Um, he is from Detroit, and for a while, uh, the reason he's interested in the left is because he was, you know, a Marxist for a long time. He said he's read all the books, the collective works of both Marx and Engels uh, numerous times, and Chomsky. Not maybe all of Chomsky's works, but many of them. Uh, he became a black Muslim uh, in Muslim Mosque Number 1 in Detroit, and, uh, you know, he describes the process of, you know, asking the people, okay, well, how did Jacob you know, breed, six, you know, like basically looking at the literal interpretation of the religion and when the reaction he got wasn't good answers but rather you shouldn't be asking stuff like that, that's when he began to walk, uh, move away and he's made lots of videos uh, debating black Muslims, I don't know how many of them are still up but uh, they're quite entertaining <laughs> yeah. uh, to listen to. These are all these are all years and years old. He's also done some really good debunking of things like uh, why was Kennedy assassinated, uh, that sort of thing. Um, really interesting guy. Uh, and you know, since he has a lot of uh, really firsthand information about the Nation of Islam, and you know, watching his videos kind of always made it interesting. And I remember asking him once, you know, if I wanted to learn about Malcolm X, what would I do? And he's, the first thing he said is, you should read his autobiography. That's a must read. Um, which is what Spike Lee says. So it is an interesting book. It's definitely a, a page turner. Um, I, one is left with the understanding that this is an incredibly intelligent, articulate, voracious reader. This guy was devouring books as much as he could. Um, his power at oratory, like I said, to espouse an idea that was clearly ridiculous. 
um, was extraordinary to the point of being unique. I don't know how many people um, could compare to him. His invective was astounding. You know, uh, on, on, a, on a scale all his own as far as I've seen, especially relative to other famous civil rights orators who he had, he had a rapprochement with people like MLK towards the end, but you know, he also had very, very stinging critiques of those civil rights leaders, many of which I think are totally valid, that they were essentially um, vote-getters for the Democratic Party, that the liberal Democrats of New England and the Northeast uh, came up with a very winning, to this day, strategy of gaining the black vote and becoming a power in the South, something. Uh, and, well, the Democrats were a power in the South because of the Solid South, but becoming you know, gaining this, this uh, political power. And um, X, Malcolm X uh, was astute to that. Uh, he, he refers to them often as house niggers or house slaves, the guy who is appeasing the boss all the time. Uh, but the, like I said, he, he, after he left the nation, became more conciliatory to these, these people. Um, it also, I guess, should be, there is some debate about his assassination. The people who, are, who were arrested and who were you know, involved in the shooting were Nation of Islam members. He was basically telling everybody who would listen that Nation of Islam members, uh, you know, the Nation of Islam was going to kill him. Uh, he had no doubt about this. However, towards the end, he did start to have doubts. So maybe that was bad wording on my part. Um, because he said some of the things that were happening to him uh, he thought were beyond the capacity of the Nation of Islam to accomplish. Uh, one thing in particular was when he went to France, he was denied entry, and he did not think the Nation of Islam had the power to do this. I think France would, there are reasons France would want to bar him from coming anyway, especially at the time period we're talking about just in the post-Algeria Civil War thing. Um, but the implication is that it was the FBI or the CIA or somebody. And actually there is a very interesting recording the FBI approached Malcolm X, soliciting him to inform on the Nation of Islam. And I believe this is when he was already suspended or, or about to have his break. You know, so he was no longer this mindless zombie of Elijah Muhammad. You can listen to it. I think it's called Malcolm versus the Snakes. Um, he, uh, he recorded this meeting, and they're offering him money. And his, his standing on principle to not become... Uh, you know, uh, an informer was, was quite impressive, especially for somebody who was now his enemy, his his mortal enemy, as it turned out, probably. Um, but yeah, there's definitely some some speculation about you know could could perhaps the government had been involved. Uh, the government had a long history of of surveilling anyway and and thwarting and by other means, if not assassination, uh, minority leaders. And I don't just mean like racial minority, but anyone who had you know opposing minority views. Um, FBI had a file on him since 1950 or 51, whenever he wrote his letter to Truman. Um, you know, so he had some doubts. He doesn't know. It was black Muslims who killed him. Maybe they were given aid. Maybe the government knew. Apparently the Nation of Islam was infiltrated by, by people uh, and uh, the FBI or CIA or whoever had a lot of information about them. Uh, so they may have known about the plot. Um, the way people like Louis Farrakhan, who at the time was not Louis Farrakhan, he was Louis X. So you hear you hear about Louis X a couple of times. You go, oh, my friend Louis X. Remember, he, he talks about talking to Louis X about Elijah Muhammad's infidelity and what they should do about it. Of course, Louis X became Louis Farrakhan, and he's the current head of the Muslims, who I'm told has gradually weaned the the ideology away from the absurd religious elements. At least that's uh, what Anton Beatty has said. I have not watched enough of. Louis Farrakhan to, to judge that for myself. I trust his, his appraisal though. Um, yeah, th there's a lot of, oh, that person, that person, it's very interesting. Uh, it's kind of a who's who. Um, you know, he met Muhammad Ali, uh, he met uh, Abdel Nasser, uh, he, he, met, he met a lot of people. Um, he took several t tours of Africa. Uh, he, he became quite a celebrity uh, in just before his break with the nation and the period immediately thereafter. So. Very interesting from a race relations kind of point of view, uh, and you know it, it's it speaks volumes against collectivism. I think you know that he came around to change his mind, 
Um, he still be he still believed in black nationalism. He I think he wanted there ideally to be a region that the blacks could all move to and and and, and run on their own. Uh, you know, he was against segregation, uh, but he was also against integration. Uh, and when he talks about you know his dealings with whites, just he, you know his view is that w whites and blacks are different people, and that you know they can maybe maybe they can intermingle some, but like they don't naturally blacks are more appealing to blacks and naturally whites are more appealing to whites and of course now for most of the book whites are appealing to whites because they're evil devils and everything they do is a lie and, and whatever and later he becomes a bit a bit more conciliatory um you know he talks about and this is depicted in the movie in the movie he, he goes to a university and a, a white girl approaches him as he's coming up the steps and says you know my my ancestors did bad things i'm not i haven't done bad things but i want to help what can i do and he just tells her nothing in real life, it was actually more dramatic than that. He went and spoke at a campus. She was so enraptured by what he said that she actually flew to New York, found the Muslim restaurant where he hung out all the time. You know, comes in, he basically tells her, you're not welcome here, white people are not welcome here. She gives him her spiel about how she feels guilty, she wants to help, and he tells her, you can't help, you can't do anything. Leave us alone. We've had enough of your help, whitey. And he talks about how much later he regretted doing that. He wishes he knew her name, uh, and that you know if any, he would go. And he said what he gives his advice, which is, "You can't join us. I don't want white people to be in our organization, but they can talk with us. They can donate us money. We can have a dialogue uh, to help work this out." And I wonder who this this. I wonder if this woman knows who she is. You would think that she might, because she obviously was so taken with the man that she would. She would have seen the movie and recognized herself, assuming she was alive, which there's a good, very good reason to assume that she probably would. Um, but she's not come forward, but it's kind of interesting how how he was touched. You know, there's two there's two kind of people, obviously Elijah Muhammad, but there's two kind of people who marked important turning points in his ideology. One was that teacher who is named, and then this girl. And it's interesting how a random person this is not where I thought I was going to go with this, but this is where, uh, you know, a random person in your life can actually change the trajectory, you know, and that's that's something that's very uh, consoling to us uh, obscure libertarians on the internet, uh, that, you know, one one connection can be the difference, you know, and the guy I'm working with, I'm letting him read some of my books, which are not explicitly libertarian, but I gave him one about Israel, and he's the other day, he's like, man, I really hate Israel now. And not that that means so much in and of itself, it doesn't mean that much in and of itself, but it's amazing what a shift can happen just with a little push here, a little push there, a nudge. Um, yeah, so I imagine this video is going to be quite long because I recorded it in two seconds. I'm going to try and hook it together. It might be in two parts. But uh, the autobiography of Malcolm X, it's a good read for any number of reasons, uh, as I've outlined. If you don't have the time, I'd say it's fair to watch the movie uh, because the movie is based very strictly off the book. Uh, and uh, it does give you, it's very similar in spirit and in tone. Uh, and in, like the, the depiction, I mean, he describes the, the kind of clothes he would wear in the 1940s, the zoot suits, and you see him depicted on the show, and there, there it is, there's the zoot suit. And then, you know, he describes. Uh, his friends and what they were like, and and the various uh, people he met in the in the Harlem underworld, what they were like, and and the white girl he met, all of them are depicted uh, very accurately in the movie, and that's you know a testament, I guess, to Spike Lee's ability to realize it. He calls it the most influential book. He says here, the most important book I'll ever read. It changed the way I thought. It changed the way I acted. It has given me courage that I didn't know I had inside me. I'm one of hundreds of thousands whose life was changed for the better. I would not say that my life has changed all that much because of this book, but it was definitely a very interesting an impressive man. It's, it's a sad day. It was sad that somebody like that with such... He had already realized more potential than the vast majority of people will all ever realize. He was 39 when he died, I think. Uh, that said, it was clear that he had incomprehensibly more potential and that was uh, cut short by presumably the Nation of Islam for what would appear to be extremely petty reasons, uh, which is uh, quite horrendous and shocking. And, uh, you know, 
I don't know. I don't want to end it on that, but that, that's kind of well. We'll end on the positive that you know one person can make a difference. One person made a bad difference in his life. You know, the teacher. You know, he, he talks about that teacher actually was. I'm glad that he told me that. He he, he told me a truth of the white man's world. Um, and then later that girl. You know, he he talks about how he would win debates, and I've been in this position. You win a debate. You win an argument with somebody, but something they say. That's a, that it creates a crack in your certainty and that seed of doubt is planted and it's not going to necessarily germinate in the course of your debate you know you're not going to because of pride and because of the way people people want to be perceived they don't want to admit to you to your face as certainly right at the time that you have a point your arguments are valid uh, but when you walk away what hit home might have a delayed reaction and I've had debates with people where I knew that this is what happened and I would tell them explicitly like I know you can't admit it now uh, but just know sooner or later we're not going to have any contact with each other but you'll know that I had a point that there is something valid you know in, in this case I would be arguing say anarcho-capitalism and, and I said just you know Appreciate your, the reason that, that you're using to come to that conclusion, or, or, or losing debate. You know, I became an anarcho-capitalist largely for losing a debate in my mind. I remember this very clearly. I had, I had, well, I was in college, and I had a, a partner. We had to do a project together, a report, basically, and he came over to my dorm room, which was very tempting in and of its own, because uh, he was quite stunning, uh, and spent about five minutes going over a report and then we just got into a political discussion and he was not somebody who held very strong political beliefs so it was not a debate it was me espousing my views and then him kind of reacting to them you know as, as a layperson would and at that time I was a minarchist and I was describing how uh, you know taxation is theft and it's coercion to you know stop people from freely associating and and, and, you know, at the time I was talking about a government based on tolls and fees and that sort of thing. And, you know, he would point out like, well, but if, you know, taxes are wrong, why are tolls and fees okay? And why, you know, like, and if coercion is wrong and monopolies are wrong, how come the government can, you know, these are, these are obvious questions. And I, of course, was able to answer. I, I came up with plausible, well, there's a, dis, there's a, difference and there are differences but there are differences that aren't philosophically that important um, you know to the point where like okay oh, so that makes sense and he walked away from it you know not thinking he had had a got you moment but in my mind I had had a got you moment I had been like that really doesn't square that really doesn't make sense and um, that was kind of for me the first like wow like the, the only principled solution is an anarchist one and I didn't get comfortable with the idea until I listened to Hans Hermann Hoppe's uh, Scott Horton interview about the myth of national defense, which was, it would have been within a few weeks or months of that anyway. So fortunately they were kind of, but if you're sincere and articulate, you know, you can, you can have an effect on people. And the thing is, a lot of times you won't ever see that effect because they'll walk away, you'll never see them again. And, you know, the seeds, the seeds you plant, like, you know, I'm not going to lie, like there is a chance that you didn't plant any or they might not germinate. And, that's maybe overusing the metaphor, but there's a chance that they will. Because it's really, for most of us, that's how it happens. You know, that's, how it, that's largely how it happened for Malcolm X, although he very much had a, a pr prophetic teacher. Well, Muhammad didn't say he was, Elijah Muhammad didn't say he was a prophet, he said he was a messenger. People conflated the two quite a bit. Um, but you know, these, these couple individuals over the course of his life that just added this one perspective that really changed everything for him. And I could say in my own political philosophy that's the case, and I think with most of you it likely is as well, to one degree or another. So, you know, that's that's definitely encouraging. Um, as crazy and weird as his collectivism was, which, you know, it's a testament that someone could be so invested in something and then rise above it to question it. That's what really separates him. I mean, the, art, the articulation, the ability to public speak and the intelligence, those are all outstanding. But what really makes him stand apart from any very the vast majority of other people is his ability to move beyond something that he invested. He had invested as totally in this as you possibly can for years, a huge section of his life, probably a third of his life. 
and yet he was able to see past it, to see its flaws, and to move on, and to and to use it, you know, to become a better, more intelligent person, a better person because of it. That's truly inspiring. So, uh, anyway, this is a super long video. If you happen to watch the whole thing, let me know. What did you think of the movie? What do you think of Malcolm X? What do you think of the Nation of Islam? And uh, what do you think about spreading seeds of doubt in people's minds? I'll talk to you all later. Assalamu alaikum.